individually for television purposes. Okay. And uh, first thing would be, from a public health standpoint, how dangerous is Hanford? Uh, I would say that it's not immediately dangerous, but if, for example, one of the big tanks that has been shown to be currently leaking, tank AY-102, if a catastrophic failure of that tank occurred, it would release so much radioactivity into the soil that it would eventually uh, have a deleterious effect on the Columbia River. And if there's radiation that goes into the Columbia River, what does that mean? Well, it means that it uh, gets into the organisms like fish that we eat, and so it would essentially degrade the, the health of the river and be at some level a threat to human health. Now, at what point does it become a threat to human health? Um, I'm not sure whether you mean, is it by ingestion or by simple exposure? exposure. Yes. Uh, I would say m much more threat by ingesting it. So uh, if, if an accident occurs that causes vaporization of some of the um, radioactive elements so that they're inhaled, or if it's deposited on for example, I-131 was deposited on plants that were eaten by cows and children then got the milk from the cows and so were subjected to dangerous levels of I-131 after the Chernobyl accident, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, as, a person who's, who, as a person who lives pretty far down river from Hanford here in the Portland area, should we be concerned? I think so. I think we should be concerned because um, it, m nothing that happens at Hanford right now is likely to have an effect on you or on me, but it may well on our children or grandchildren. And these um, deleterious, deleterious effects are so long-lived that we have to be concerned about future generations. Being on the advisory board, are you concerned about the leaks that have occurred out there recently? Uh, yes. And why? <laughs> well, because the leaks get into the uh, zone between the surface of the ground and the groundwater. But gradually, those contaminants work their way down to the groundwater, which is in contact with the Columbia River. So eventually, those things get into the river. I understand that in Hanford's history, there has been some radioactivity that has gotten into the water. Uh, tell me about that and, and what was done in order to stop that from occurring. OK, during the time um, that we were producing plutonium, the early times during the Second World War and for a number of years thereafter, uh, the, the reactors were cooled by Columbia River water, which was pumped into the reactor and then went back out into the river. And there were low concentrations of minerals in that water, which became radioactive when they were in the reactor and were pumped directly back into the water. So that during the late 40s and early 50s, uh, and I'm not sure exactly what year, but radioactivity was detected in shellfish at the mouth of the Columbia River. So clearly, there was enough radiation getting in to be detectable uh, at that level. And of course, the entire length of the river from Hanford to Astoria was contaminated during those years. Well, eventually, well, the first thing they did was, after the water came out of the reactor, they would store it for a while so that the radioactivity would naturally decrease before the water was pumped back into the river. And then they, they changed the design of the reactors so that the uh, cooling water, um, there was sort of a double loop system so that 
the, uh, the cooling water from the river never actually went into the reactor to be, to be made radioactive. Okay. So and, and last thing, because I know you have to get your, your talk started here. Uh, when we look at what our congressional delegation is doing right now, what do you think about the timing of these requests concerning the, the uh, leaks in the tanks? And why now? Why is there so much attention being, being paid to these leaks now? Well, I think partially because the, the tanks are continuously failing. And the first double shell tank failed. I, I think most of us felt that those double shell tanks were probably good for a long, long time. And the fact that one of them failed really caught our attention. But also, very importantly, Senator Wyden has been a strong force uh, advocating cleanup of the, the Hanford Reservation. So uh, most people know that he was recently the chair of the Energy Committee, and he's still on as a member of the Energy Committee. And he has been a very powerful force uh, pushing to get this uh, contaminated location cleaned up. And uh, c cleaning up the contamination will take decades, correct? It will take decades, and the current the current estimate of the cost of completing the cleanup is $120 billion. Currently, they're spending about $2 billion per year, but half of that is just to maintain safe conditions on the site. So only $1 billion per year is actually going into active cleanup activities. Well, the, the math is simple. We don't want to take 120 years to get this cleaned up. So it's essential that more funds be allocated toward this. And parenthetically, but very important, all of our power reactors are generating more and more of this waste. And Hanford can be considered a kind of poster child for how difficult it is to deal with radioactive waste. The power reactors have produced uh, 70,000 tons of spent fuel. So it's, it's a continuing and very, very difficult problem. It's a pretty strong argument for stopping uh, nuclear power. Beautiful. Thank you. Hi. Hello. Oh, you know how? Is it that? What's that? No. Okay, that's fine. Well, James uh, has planned to have a script here, um, so Dr. John Allison is going to go first. I think the presentation needs to be changed on the computer. Yeah, it does. It's just... Uh, So the Hanford uh, Nuclear Reservation is about a four-hour drive east from Portland, mostly along the river. It's a beautiful drive. You get out a little bit uh, past Hermiston and turn north, and you, in a half hour you get to the Tri-Cities. Richland, Washington is immediately adjacent to the Hanford Nuclear Reservation. Uh, we can divide the um, reservation into a number of areas. The zone in green um, is uh, a part that is not contaminated um, by the activities there. And I think the plan is to turn that into some sort of a national park. But the, within the uh, cleanup area, the river corridor is very important because it's where the nine nuclear reactors are located. Most of them have been uh, put into what's called interim safe storage. So they, they've been put into uh, essentially airtight containments. Um, and they will remain there for an estimated 75 years. Uh, then the uh, inner area, the, called the Central Plateau, has a lot of facilities that, um, that are um, 
actively being cleaned up, and we'll, we'll look at some of those in a minute. And then finally, the uh, tank wastes are a separate but very important issue. I realize there's a lot on as I go along. Uh, this uh, this f f uh, is an old figure. So there were 1,900 wastes as of a few years ago, but they've cleaned up several hundred of them now. So the figure is much lower, but still a very high number of waste. And as for a billion gallons of contaminated liquid was dumped onto the soil, and much of it into contamination that was dumped into the environment during the active operation of these plutonium-producing plants. Uh, as you see, 56 million gallons of uh, contaminated waste is currently in the tanks, and at least 67 of the tanks are known or suspected leakers. And of course, in the last uh, year or so, we've become aware that one of the double shell tanks has also leaked. These 67 are uh, part of the 149 single shell tanks that were built from 19 onward, but with a design life of 20 years. Um, cleanup has been in progress for a long time, but it's, we're going to be with this project for a long time to come. Shoreline burial sites should be largely cleaned up by 2015, but uh, as I mentioned, the reactors are going to remain there for another 75 years after which they will have cooled down enough that they can more easily dismantle them and take them to a final burial site. Uh, construction, the current estimate of its cost is $13.4 billion, and it was scheduled to begin operation sometime fairly soon, but that's just not going to happen. And full operation was supposed to happen by 2022, and that's not going to happen either. We can just deal with it. Um, the 300 area is an area where uh, fuel was fabricated for the nine reactors that produced plutonium. And uh, as you can see in this text, 27 million cubic yards of uh, radioactive materials were buried on the site or dumped into ponds or trenches. Now, this is what it looked like in 07, and this is what it looks like today. So they have removed a lot of the buildings, and they would have removed at least one more, the so-called 324 building, except that they discovered that in a hot cell, which is a, a shielded room, uh, where they do, by remote handling, they do work with highly radioactive materials. One of these hot cells had cracks in the floor, and highly radioactive material had leaked through the floor into the ground. So what they're going to have to do is get in there with remote digging devices and dig up the floor and the soil under the floor and put it into one of the other hot cells that had not leaked, partially dismantle the building, and take that hot cell with the radioactive material in it, and pick it up, and move it to another area out of the river corridor. Now, they've removed all this stuff from the surface of the ground, and it looks great. But don't forget that a lot of the contamination is under the ground, where you don't see it. Okay, here are uh, a list. There are hundreds of contaminants, but here are some of the most significant ones. Uh, this um, chromium, uh, much of it is hexavalent chromium, which is a known carcinogen. Now, they've worked very, very hard, and in some instances have dug all the way down to the groundwater to dig out the soil that had this chromium in it and uh, take it to a, a safer area away from the river. 
and in addition, they have extensive, an extensive pump and treat system where they, uh, they've dug a hundreds of wells, many of which are for sampling, but many of which pump the water up into a treatment plant where it's run through an ion exchange resin to take out seven key contaminants. And then it's pumped back in uh, at a location between the source of the contamination and the river to create a kind of a hydrostatic barrier that discourages the movement of these contaminants toward the river. Um, so picture of uh, some of the contaminants. And you can see it's a complex arrangement with uh, some areas having uh, two or more contaminants uh, sort of on top of one another. Uh, these plumes of contamination gradually move through the uh, zone between the surface and the groundwater, and they're moving in a roughly southeast direction toward the river. <coughs> of uh, the uh, land. It's a cartoon which shows that if contamination is coming out of a building, it gradually works its way down through what they call the Vedo zone, which is the, the soil between the surface of the ground and the groundwater below. So it gradually works its way down through that, and then in the groundwater, to, it moves toward the Columbia River. The last part of this trip is called, um, well, it's in the periodic, periodically re-wetted zone. So when the river is really high, the flow of, ground, of this water will be back into the land. And then when the river is low, it flows out again. So it's sort of a dynamic system that moves these contaminants toward the river. OK, tank waste status, shell tanks. As I mentioned, they're built of carbon steel. They had a predicted or engineering life of 20 years. And you know, so they're three and a half times past their predicted life. They're rusting, and they uh, will eventually all leak, so they need to be emptied. Uh, when they discovered that 67 of the tanks were known or suspected leakers, they wisely said, we got to do something about this. And so they pumped out all the liquid that they could get out with their pumps and put it into the double shell tanks. That, uh, that stopped the act of leaking. But there's a great deal of solid material in this, these tanks. And as you can imagine, in the interstices within the solid material, there's still liquid there. So it's, and, and that's the problem they're dealing with now. So the pumpable liquid is out. And um, as they clean out these tanks, their mandate is to get 99% of the contents, the solids from the tank, uh, taken out. But don't forget, 99% may not be enough. Because if you start out, well, first of all, a curie is the amount of radiation that comes out of one gram of radium. And it's a lot of radiation. Uh, if you held a gram of radium in your hand for a few minutes, it would do serious damage to you. So 1% um, of a million curies, and some of these tanks have a million curies in them, is still 10,000 curies. So it's a huge amount of radiation. Now, after they pump out the 99%, the tank goes into a status that says it's technically emptied. But they're going to re-examine these. And between the Department of Energy and the Washington Department of Ecology, there will be some kind of debate or interchange. And they'll decide what needs to be done in, in removing the rest of it. What the Department of Energy wants to do, and they justify this by an environmental impact statement, 
uh, is they want to add grout to the tanks to solidify this material and stabilize it to a degree and then leave it there. So they don't plan to remove the tanks. They plan to do a so-called closure operation that will leave 1% of the uh, contaminants in the tanks uh, and the tanks will remain there indefinitely. Um, okay, so one of the regions, the regions where uh, a lot of activity occurred and a lot of cleanup activity is currently going on is called the Central Plateau. We are east of the Central Plateau and up probably in a helicopter looking toward the west. In the foreground here, you see the waste treatment plant, this $13.4 billion construction job that's supposed to end up with a very complex chemical plant that will take the waste out of the tank and combine it with some glass making materials so that you'll end up with a glass log that has the contaminants trapped within it. The glass logs will be inside stainless steel capsules. And the reason they want to do this is that if you trap something in glass, it's physically stable. It doesn't dissolve in water, and it won't turn to dust and blow away in the air. So it's easier to handle. And if they get that into these capsules, they can then move it into a ge so-called geologic re repository the sort of thing that they wanted to do with Yucca Mountain. And that whole program is in abeyance now, so we don't have a geologic repository except for one site in Carlsbad, New Mexico, in a salt mine where we were able to put a limited amount of materials. OK, each of these white flags is one of the tank farms. So that's where all 149 single shell tanks and 28 double shell tanks are located. Here's uh, a 1947 picture of a 530,000 gallon tank under construction. It still contains waste. Here's another picture of a tank farm being built. So they start out by digging a great big hole, and then they constructed these tanks within this excavation. And when they got them finished, they covered the whole thing up with soil, with 6 to 10 feet of soil over the top <coughs> of the tank to absorb the radiation from the contaminants within the tank. Each tank had a number of pipes going down into the tank for sampling or for doing um, whatever they wanted to do with the materials in the tank. and the in general, the largest of these was only about 12 or 14 inches in diameter. So it's right now they're having to get instruments down through this very small hole in order to work inside the tank. And I'll show you some, uh, some further development there. The, oh, let me back up just a sec. Uh, OK, this is the sea farm now. And you can see there's a huge amount of activity going on. They've got uh, surface pipes going everywhere. And what they're doing is they're pumping liquid out of the double shell tanks and using that liquid with uh, a high pressure device inside the tank that squirts this solid sludge uh, and crystalline material, the solids within the tank to mobilize them so that they can pump it back out in this, into the double shell tanks. They're using tank waste as the fluid in order not to increase the total volume that they eventually are going to have to deal with. The problem is that they have something of a limit of the amount of double shell tank space available. They're required to have a million gallons of capacity available in case of an emergency. And with tank uh, 
AY-102 having failed and, and containing a million gallons worth of stuff, they've, they're in a bind now because they just don't have the double shell tank space available to continue this and other kinds of projects. Okay, here's the sea farm that is the same as the previous slide. Tanks that have been emptied and the others are in various stages. They're supposed to have all these emptied by 2019 and I think enough pressure is being put on the Department of Energy, they'll probably make that. But this was one of the easiest tank farms to deal with. I think they wisely started with something that had less technical challenges than, than some others. But uh, in any case, um, the rate of emptying these tanks is not sufficient to get the job done in an acceptable length of time, my opinion. Um, here they uh, cut a 55-inch hole in the top of a tank in order to be able to get devices in to clean it out. And you can see this was the device that did the cutting and the whole thing had to be shrouded and you can see the workers have to have gear on that protects them from exposure to the radioactive materials in the tank, both gases and potentially solid material in the form of sort of dust or, um, but in any case, this sort of thing makes the cleanup difficult, that the workers need to be protected and they have, uh, they've got to don this gear and then take it off and it all consumes a heck of a lot of time which in turn consumes a heck of a lot of money. Here's the waste treatment plant. What happened was that there were some tanks within this um, pretreatment facility what the pretreatment was supposed to do was it was supposed to sep separate low-level waste from high-level waste. They then would have two streams, one going to low-level glass melters and the other to high-level glass melters with different formulations of the glass. But what happened was that they discovered that some of the tanks within the pretreatment facility were designed in such a way that there was a possibility that particles of plutonium would settle in these tanks and form an, and, and have enough plutonium at the bottom of a tank that it might become critical. That is, it might start a nuclear reaction. Not an explosion, but the sort of thing that goes on in a power reactor and it would generate, well, it would be a disaster if something like that happened. So what they had to do when this came up is they had to stop and so they're, they're trying to work that out before they continue with construction of the pretreatment facility. Uh, other parts of the facility are continuing, both the high level waste uh, facility where the melter is going to be for that type of uh, waste and also the low level uh, plant it are moving toward completion of the construction. It is hoped that some of the low level activity material in the tanks can be directly fed into this low activity glass making machine and not have to go through the pretreatment plant. If they can work that out, it will be a way to sort of jumpstart the uh, cleanup operation. Okay, now I want to talk to you about what I think are uh, three of the highest risk problems at Hanford. One is the, uh, it's not part of the Department of Energy uh, operation right now, but it's surrounded by the Hanford Nuclear Reservation. It's part of the 300 area that has been uh, given over to uh, the Columbia Generating Station. This nuclear power plant, which was the only, of the only one of the whoops power plants that actually got completed, has uh, a reactor that is uh, essentially, is quite similar to the one uh, at Fukushima. 
So this Fukushima was a Mark I, and what's at the Columbia Generating Station is a Mark II. But I think the containment is the same, and it's also the case that the spent fuel pool here is also the same as what was present at Fukushima. You can see here, uh, this part of the slide indicates how much high-level radioactive waste, that is spent fuel, is at the Columbia Generating Station. So here's the amount it takes to do a 10 megaton weapon. Here's the amount that was released at the Chernobyl accident. And here are the amounts at the Columbia Generating Station here. It's, oh, and this is the stuff in the uh, pond within the reactor building. And then this is the amount that's uh, in, the, in dry cask storage, which is a much more stable and safer type of storage because dry casks don't require cooling uh, to, uh, to remain stable. Uh, their recent studies have shown that there is much more in the way of earthquake risk uh, in this region than was thought earlier. This uh, picture shows the faults in the region of the nuclear reservation. And when these increased earthquake risks were discovered, the waste treatment plant construction was altered to increase its earthquake resistance by about 38%. So it was upgraded very, very significantly. But the Columbia Generating Station was not upgraded. So, and, and they're trying to defend why they haven't done that. So our view is that it represents a pretty significant hazard. This map shows that um, within a 50 mile radius, if you had to evacuate, there are 381,000 people that would have to be moved. Within a 10 mile radius, it's still 11,500. Second big problem is this waste encapsulation storage facility called the WESIF. And it contains a huge amount of radioactivity, about a third of the total radioactivity at the, uh, in the Hanford facility is in this building. 131 million curies uh, of radioactivity, which is an almost unimaginable amount. And it's stored in a pool of water that has to be continually cooled because it's generating uh, 1.2 million BTUs per hour. Um, a big house will take a three ton cooling unit to uh, keep it cool in a hot, on a hot summer day. In order to cool this pool, you'd need 33 of those units operating. So if, if this facility were to lose power or lose the water, it would be a disaster. The Department of Energy's own inspector general recently looked at this WESIF and advised the Department of Energy that this was an unacceptable danger and that they should move this radioactive material, the cesium and strontium, out into dry cask storage where it would not require power or water to remain safe. I'm done. <laughs> OK. This is uh, Department of Energy makes big plans like this. They do it every year, and it's what they hope to do, and it's a good approach. Um, current, what has already been spent, you can see, is a little over, a, uh, somewhat over $100 billion, and they think it'll take another $115 billion to complete the task, but uh, the amount that's being spent per year would require just way too many years to get the job done. So we need to put pressure on our people in Congress
to get them to allocate more money so that the Department of Energy can get on with this cleanup. It's really important to the future of the region. Thank you. Sorry for running over. Yeah, I, d I don't know the number. I just know it's thousands. And the monitoring program, I think, is, is very good. That is, they have a large cadre of people who are trained in radiation protection and who monitor the operations. They're right out there in the tank farms and other facilities. And of course, they do wear highly sensitive radiation detection monitors. The, the current inventory of, nuclear, of spent fuel from power reactors uh, in the United States is uh, something over 70,000 metric tons uh, of heavy metal. So it's many times the amount of, many, many times the amount of waste at Hanford. Their spent fuel inventory currently, I mean, th there's much more than spent fuel out there, but their spent fuel inventory, I think, is only something like 2,800 tons. Yeah. <laughs>